Good day, I hope you are well. Uh, this is the recording of the last tutorial, which will be on estate duty. Yeah, the last tutorial. So guys, yeah, it has been a very long year. I hope um, if you've been attending tutori tutorials and even if you're only watching online, I hope I have been off, like um, I've been very helpful to you. And uh, also I just wanna apologize for not being able to make it uh, to the last hut. I could not do it physically, right? Because I have a personal matter that I'm, I, I have to attend to. So, hence I'm doing the recording so that you guys can just watch the recording instead of going to the last touch, which would have been at, I think, Malaho, mi, mi, yeah, Milaho on uh, campus from half one to half past two. Right, okay. Um, and like I've said, today we are dealing with estate duty and guys. procedure stays the same like I always say please 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 before you begin doing a question always start with the marks take note of the mark in this case we're gunning for 20 marks and then the allocated time is 30 minutes but that's supposed to be I forgot to change it that's supposed to be 40 minutes because you guys now get um, two minutes per mark so that's supposed to be 14 minutes right so we have about 40 minutes to do this question and guys this should not be like just to, for fun or um, just a mere exercise you do you should actually idea to this thing because trust me when you're, when you're writing a paper with a lot of questions it matters you must try and attempt all the questions in the paper and you can only do so if you adhere to the the strict term, uh, the, the time limitations right and then also also like um it took me a while to realize this but trust me the time you spent in a question after your time has elapsed so after the 40 minutes has elapsed you are probably not even writing things down there you are probably just thinking there so you are not earning marks and though in a test the last thing you want to do is to have your hand stationary and you're just thinking because every minute counts and like i said so you must at least spend two minutes to get a mark right and if you're spending like four minutes to get a, a single mark then you essentially you essentially won't finish that's what it means so please be mindful of that and it's a big task try to break it down to smaller things and like make sure that essentially you are prepared enough so that by the time you go to the test your hand is just moving and you're just writing and ending marks and not at even at a single point should your hand be stationary and when you're just thinking but yeah that's my two cents on that and then the most second thing is you must read the required and i say this and people usually laugh but the scenario is not a bedtime story it's not a bedtime story you're not supposed to entertain you and you know you are supposed to take extract information from from the scenario and the only way you can effectively uh, extract information from the scenario is by reading the required first because if you've done that then you have given yourself purpose now you know what is wanted you know uh, like what you are essentially required to do in order to score the 20 marks so let's do that this question we are required to calculate the estate duty payable in relation to Elvis uh, Picasso's estate do your calculation in the correct estate duty format and I've already have it prepared here right so this is the format and guys do you know i think you should appreciate by now that formats are very very important in text if you don't follow the format you will lose marks trust me so but what's nice is for your state duty it's a pretty easy format to learn here you have property and then after, after that you must add your deemed property i'll go in i can explain when we're doing the scenario what actually is property and what actually is deemed property but property even from donations tax you know it has a very broad definition it's uh, both movable and immovable property tangible and um, untangible property or any other rights to property so it's a very very wide thing and it even includes money whereas for cgt it's only on assets and currency is excluded from the definition of assets so money would not be part of such a tea, but it will definitely form part of your estate duty and donations tax because it is property and then gross estate will essentially be the sum of your deemed and deemed property and the normal property and then you do your deductions and then you deduct from your gross estate your deductions to get the net estate right then after that you apply your abatement of at least 
well, no, I'll say at least, of 2.5 million rands, right? But there are, there are exceptions. It can be less if the net estate is less than 2.5 million rands, and it can be more than 2.5 million rands if you're dealing with a sub, uh, surviving spouse and, and the first spouse who passed away did not utilize the full 3.5 million rands, so they get the excess that the other spouse did not utilize plus their 3.5 million rands. Then the utable amount, you deduct essentially your abatement from the net estate, you get the utable amount, and then you levy tax at 20% or 25%, right? Against the same threshold as donations tax, which is 30 million rands. And essentially, if you really, really like put in time and just think about this topic uh, on a like I don't know on a fundamental level like the fundamentals of it is essentially what we're doing here we are taxing the transfer of wealth due to death that's all we're doing here we're taxing the transfer of wealth due to death and what that means is essentially it's, it's the twin I would say and I put it that way it's a twin to donations tax because for donations tax we tax the transfer of wealth whilst the, the donor is alive, right? But for donation, for estate duty, the, the trigger for the transfer of wealth is death, and we tax that uh, that event. Or we, we essentially compute the tax effect for that event, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's about it. But the main thing is you should know this format. You should know this format. I think it's pretty much easy to learn. You can even think about it maybe in terms of gross income property. Would be your gross income per the definition in deemed property will be this special inclusions to gross income the deemed property then you get your essentially this would be your gross income right gross estate in this case then you just factor in your deductions you know and then you have your net estate and then you do your abatement and then you get your dutiful amount like it's, it's a pretty straightforward uh, format to learn okay um and then they tell us here to show all our calculations guys please 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 this is a uh, nb 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 make sure you show your calculations make sure you show your calculations otherwise you'll lose very easy marks as i'll show now and clearly indicate when amount is not taken into account so you must indicate when amount is not taken into account and they tell us that that is you must give reasons for nil effects right or for nil amounts so whenever you include a nil amount give a reason why it's nil right okay so now let's read the um, the question so i told you elvis pegasoli atlantic peter died on 15 january 2023 at the age of 89 years so we know we're dealing with elvis pegasoli who died on 15 jan 2023 and he was 89 years old but for a state duty this almost becomes useless the age of the deceased because when you have to do your limited interest, you look at the life expectancy, and the life expectancy of someone who passed away is zero, guys. Like once you go underneath the ground, you you will never come back again. Well, in the physical form, right? So your life expectancy is zero. So yeah, that's why I said all. Well, because remember, for limited interest, we we'll look at the next age. This guy doesn't have a next age. He passed away at eighty nine. You know, he won ten ninety type of thing. That's all I'm trying to make make you understand okay so elvis is survived by his wife patricia so patricia is the wife and this is a very important person i hope you know for a tax doesn't matter if it's normal tax cgt like the spouse like spouse trigger special effects for tax in this in the case of a state duty they trigger a deduction in terms of section 42 and whichever what uh, whichever thing the spouse gets it will qualify as a deduction and then uh, for CGT, you know, they trigger a rollover. And then for um, for normal tax, oh, sorry, for normal tax, depending on the marriage regime, if it's in the community of property, then you know um, non-trade income is uh, divided by two. So your rental of, fix, of, of fixed property, your dividends, your interest, and other non-trade income, you have to divide it by two if they're married in the community of property and the asset falls within the joint estate. So like i'm trying to just make you understand that the spouse like a spouse there are a lot of tax effects associated with the spouse depending on the tax you're dealing with and we are told that they were married out of community of property yeah guys this is a godsend you should be very very happy when you read those words that these people were married out of community of property because if it was in community of property then you have to compute the value of the joint estate essentially the net value of the joint estate right and then
and you divide that by two and then you take that and then you factor in all um, transactions or property um, specific to the deceased like funeral costs li limited interest to property because those are personal rights and all those kind of things until you get to your to your essentially your natal state to apply your your abatement and then you get to, to your duty amount so yeah be mindful of that and also this is nice because it it's without the accrual system right so you don't have to determine um, who has a, a higher accrual compared to the other but if you had to if it was with the accrual system you ask us well i think the simplest approach is this you just add both what they accumulated from the date they were married until death you add it up you divide it by two right so let's say one uh, accumulated 500,000, the other accumulated 700,000. So you add that up, that'd be 1.2 million rands. You divide by two, that's 600,000 rands. And then what that means is the one who's at 500,000 must go to 600,000. And the one who's at uh, 700,000 must go down to 600,000. So if the deceased is at 700,000, then the accrual would be a deduction, right? To, to get into 600,000 or here to 600,000. However, if the deceased is... Um, is the one with the lesser accrual then this would be deemed property to them and you'd be an addition to to, to property of um essentially a hundred thousand right easiest another easy way you just say okay the 700 minus the five hundred thousand divided by two get hundred to ask yourself who has the lesser and you do what i've just discussed essentially patricia is 82 years old patricia is still alive so we need to know her age and you know in, in this case her next birthday is 83 if you if she uh, gets any but in this case it, it really like if maybe she if Patrick uh, Elvis left an annuity in her name then like okay or she, I don't know maybe she she'll get I don't know a use of it or something but yeah um Patricia was 82 years old at the date of Elvis's death Elvis is also survived by three children but Emily and Katie so that's his children but Emily and Katie who are 59, 56, and 48 years old at the date of his death, respectively. After many trips around the world and teaching at, at various places, Elvis became ordinarily resident in South Africa for the first time in 1994. So, he became ordinarily resident in South Africa. What that means is that now, since he is ordinarily resident in South Africa, then we must include all his property wherever it is located in the world. If he was not ordinarily resident in South Africa, then you would only take into account property in South Africa, like property he owns in South Africa. But since he's ordinarily resident in South Africa, then you must take into account all his property irrespective of where it is. Then also here, that's another important thing that um, he became a resident for the first time in 1994. So you know anything, any property he got before 1994 would qualify as a donation. Any foreign property he got before 1994 would qualify as a deduction. Okay, let's go now. Um, Elvis's estate consisted of the following assets. So he had a private home in Table View, Cape Town, which was valued at 2.5 million rands on date of death. And guys, guys, be careful. We always, you only, essentially, you mainly, mainly, I'm saying not only, but mainly, interested in the market value at the date of death, which is what I think in this case was 15 January 2023. Elvis bequeathed the use of of the house, so he bequeathed the use of of the house to his daughter Katie and the bed dominium to his other daughter Emily. Right. So this may be a little bit tricky to you guys, but let's talk about what's happening here. So. Elvis owned the whole house. He owned both the use thereof and he could decide whether or not whether or not to sell it. So he had full ownership. And full ownership, as you've already learned in donations tax, is determined or is represented by the market value. Right. Um but uh, at death he then bequeaths um the usufruct to the daughter and then the bed dominium to another daughter. Um, Emily right in this case when it comes to property now when you have to determine this property you maybe you may be confused should you maybe calculate the use the value of the use of right and then calculate the value of the bed dominion the answer is no because for property you just ask yourself what did this person own when they passed away and this person owned the full house so in this case we just say um, private home 
which is in Cape Town, and you value it at 2.5 million rands. Okay, I don't have a number zero there. You value it at 2.5 million rands, and that's all. You are done. Like we are done. If it was sold, you then take the proceeds. So for property, pr property, the key thing here is this: if an asset is sold, uh, you take the proceeds from the sale. Uh, except for unlisted shares. For unlisted shares, you always take the market value of the unlisted shares, even if they are sold. But for any other type of property, you take the proceeds as they are, including a farm a farm where bonafide farming is conducted. You don't reduce the proceeds if the farm is sold, where bonafide farming, uh, is, bonafide farming activities are conducted. You don't reduce them by 30%, you take them as they are. However, if the property is not sold, then we take the market value of the property at death and we value that property on our estate duty calculation at the market value at death, except for um, bon uh, farm where bonafide farming activities uh, are conducted. Then for that, you must reduce that market value by 30%, which essentially means just calculate the market value by 70%. Right, and I think yeah, that's like the only thing. And for shares, for unlisted shares, you always take the market value as valued by an independent auditor. Or an in, yeah. So yeah, that's property. And then another key thing is, like for example, in this case, don't confuse yourself. Don't get lost in the scenario. You just ask yourself simply, what did this person own at death? If they owned that whatever thing they owned at death, then come and record that thing as property, right? And just yourself, is it sold? If it's sold, take the proceeds. Except for unlisted shares, where you always take the market value. If it's not sold, then you take the market value at the date of death. And yeah, okay. Yeah, we're done with that. Uh, one of your verses, uh, but okay, but to come back here for this one. For this one, you learned on the last lecture that um, the person who gets a use of right will be liable on the estate duty. But in this case, we don't have to do that. But in that case, so that's the only reason you cal can um, calculate the value of the use of right so that you can essentially determine um, what value of the, um, the the estate duty payable will be liable to the person getting the use of right. So in other words, how much should Katie pay towards um, the estate duty liability? So that would be the value of the use of right over the net the net uh, estate value of um, Elvis's estate multiplied by the estate duty, and then you get the portion attributable to that use of right, right? Okay, uh, so for number two, one of Elvis's masterpieces, oh no, I'm highlighting that. <laughs> One of Elvis's masterpieces, the Lisa Mona, which has spent the past uh, 12 years. Okay, wait, let me start again. One of Elvis's masterpieces, the Lisa Mona, because Ron is a painter, which he has spent the last, uh, the past 12 years of his life painting, is valued at a market value of 6 million rands on the date of his death. So it has the market value of 6 million rands on the date of death. The painting was sold, so keyword there, the painting was sold, and like I've just explained, whenever you see that something was sold, disposed, or whatever way, they, another way they put it, then you use the proceeds instead of the market value. It was sold to the paintings forever gallery for 5,250,000 rands on 21 February 2023. The proceeds were paid directly to the estate. So, uh, for this one, it's quite simple. The Lizamona, you take 5,250,000 rands if it was not sold, since this is a work of art, because the they tell us that, that for books, pictures, paintings, and other works of art, you essentially value them if they are not sold at the average of the net receipts over the past three years. So you calculate the average net receipts over the past three years. So you say, okay, the net receipts for year one plus those of year two plus those of year three divided by three, and that would be the value. So you wouldn't take the market value in that case. You take the average of the, the net receipts for books, pictures, and other works of art, so including paintings. But in this case, it's sold, so we just take the 5,250,000 rands. <coughs> so, Lisa Mona, it is disposed, so we take the 5,250,000 rands. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, we continue. And it's not exempt but yeah another thing is I, I advise you guys to just i mean you can look at this thing you can look at the like you have what essentially you can say one two three four five 
six, seven, eight, and those are your deductions, right? Because we tell you here about liabilities and costs. So you can like what I'm getting to is you can quickly write the whole before you even answering the thing. You can write the whole um, format it's because this is important because when you are dealing with a note. Like for example, you may read something here and you include it as property, and then you know based on what it's supposed to be, it qualifies as a deduction as well. And then you can do that in the same time. You don't have to wait until you are done with property, and then you have to reread the the scenario. In other words, like investing double the time, you can just do it in one go. So I don't know. Maybe I should just yeah. But I hope you guys get me. All I'm saying is this. Before you answer, once you've gone through your question in full, you can just quickly calculate like the notes we have, or of course you have we would have read it anyway. You can calculate okay, or estimate by calculating the number of notes that okay maybe under property you will probably need to leave ten lines or something, and then you write in property, and then you say maybe I need to leave two or three or five lines, and then you get to deductions, and you say maybe I'll probably need to leave I don't know so many lines, and then this is before and so that. When you are coming back again and reading the scenario now, whenever you read um, an item, if it, it has both an inclusion into property and also a deduction, you can just quickly read that. Then you come included it here as property and you also quickly come and deduct it. That way it's faster and you, you ensure that you are earning four marks. Right? Instead of doing property and you read that scenario and you do property because you read it first time without writing and you read it again and you maybe just do your property and deem property. Then you have to re-read re it again when you are dealing with deductions. So yeah, I think that's cumbersome. But yeah, and you lose time that way. Okay, um, we are done there. So we have two life insurance policies. Proceeds of policy A paid into the estate. So they were paid into the estate. 1.5 million rands. Elvis paid all the premiums. So Elvis paid all the premiums. And remember that if the deceased paid all the premiums, then what that means is he can we cannot deduct the those premiums plus six percent thereof uh, from the uh, the payout amount because they were paid by the deceased. But if they were paid by any other person, then they would be deductible, which amounted to seventy three thousand five hundred rand. So these are the premiums and the interest they on at six percent, including the interest they on at six percent per annum. So um, <coughs> now this the policy is deemed property. Why is it deemed property? Because it came into being as a result of death. In this case, as a result of Elvis's death. So anything which came into being as a result of the deceased, um, the, the taxpayer essentially dying, then that will be deemed property. So let's look here. The policy A paid out because um, Elvis passed away. So it came into being because the uh, the taxpayer passed away. So it's deemed property. It came into being because of the event, which is death. So for policy A, quickly. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, one point five million rands. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, no, I don't think it will help. And then for the premiums. Premiums um, zero, like I said, we're then not deductible. Why? Because paid, they were paid by the deceased, which is Elvis, and thus not deductible. Maybe you might even know that. Thus not deductible. Right. Maybe let me wrap this. Thus not deductible. <coughs> And then we quickly move process from policy B, right? Paid to Patricia, and remember I said anything paid to the or that goes to from the deceased estate to the spouse, surviving spouse, it will qualify most likely qualify as a deduction unless it is the it is included at zero, right? So policy B paid to Patricia in terms of a registered antinatural agreement. Um, so the policy paid out six hundred thousand rands. Patricia paid all the premiums, so she paid all the premiums in the policy, which amounted to 33,500 rands, and this includes interest at 6% per annum. So in this case, because this policy is paid out in terms of a registered antinatural agreement, 
we are told that we must include zero, right? If it was paid to the spouse, but not in terms of a registered antinatural agreement, then we would include the 600,000 rands because it was on the life of the deceased. That's another thing you should be mindful of, that you only include policies taken on the life of the deceased. And these policies will become deemed property because they'll pay out since the, 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 the person they're insuring the life thereof has passed away. So that will be deemed property that way. But if a policy is paid up to the surviving spouse in terms of a registered antinatural agreement, or if it's put up to the spouse's child, the, the, the deceased child, then it's um, it, it 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 is um, the, it is included at zero, right? So let's say the uh, policy. Let me just write that down. Policy B zero because it's paid. Okay, registered. Antinatural agreement. I hope I'm writing correct. And then it's zero there. Okay, cool. And then obviously, since it's zero, you cannot deduct these, not because the value is zero, they cannot create a deduction. So this goes, this falls away. But if it was included at 600,000, we would have to include 600,000 less 33,500 rands there, right? Because Patricia paid all those premiums. Okay, we we'll move on. A piece of land with a castle on it in Den Haag, Netherlands. So what that should trigger in your brain is that obviously Netherlands is a foreign country, so we are probably dealing now with foreign property, which is a, 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 a castle, right? With a market value of 9,450,000 rands on the date of death, Elvis inherited this property from his late grandmother, a non resident in 1979. So Elvis inherited this property from his late grandmother, who was a non resident, but in 1979. And remember, we told you that Elvis became a resident of South Africa in 1994 for the first time, right? So that should already trigger something in your mind. And what it should trigger is that this qualifies as a deduction because Elvis. Um, owned this foreign property before he became ordinarily resident in South Africa. No foreign estate duty was payable on these assets. So what that means is, after you've determined your dutiable amount, if you had to determine the, you, if you did, if they paid foreign estate duty on it, you would then quite deduct the foreign estate duty paid on the property, but limited to the value of the, um, to the value of the thingy. The, the 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 estate duty of that property in the taxpayer's estate, right? So if the property, if this value, if this property, the nine million four hundred fifty thousand rands, um, is not is not exempt is, or is not does not qualify as a deduction, then it will form part of the net estate, and obviously, the dutiable amount and then estate duty will be levied thereon. So, if he also paid a uh, foreign estate duty on the same property then he would qualify for a rebate essentially from the estate duty amount but that would be limited to the um, the, the the portion of the estate duty liability attributable to this foreign property right so you choose the lesser of the two if the foreign estate duty is lesser than the portion attrib attributable to this uh, property or the estate duty paid in terms of this property in south africa then it's fully deductible. But if it's not, then you limit it to the estate duty attributable to this property in South Africa. You can also read silk if maybe I'm not making sense. But it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. So they tell us no foreign estate duty was payable on these assets. So you don't have to worry about that in this question. But in future, if a foreign estate duty was payable, then you'd have to do what I've just explained. Um, this property is left to Bart in terms of Elvis's valid will. At the date of Elvis's death, there was for children. There are really no special things, right? So yeah, not really need to highlight anything there. At the date of Elvis's death, there was an amount of hundred and ten thousand rands owing to the local authorities in Den Haag. So this is now foreign debt, right? Because this is an amount owed to a foreign institution, right? In respect of areas, property rates, electricity, and services. Okay, let's deal with the implications. So here, yeah, I hope like this is why I always stress, guys, that you must do questions because when you're just reading silk, they won't expose you to how these things can be interpreted. 
right? One or two questions, only then you see like, okay, these things can be asked this way, if they can be combined this way. In this question, there are a lot of things happening. One, we have property, which he owned, which is in Den Haag. So we're dealing with foreign property. It was not sold, so you value it at 9,450,000 francs. So the easy mark, easy, easy mark, you can get here. It's not deemed property because it was there before he even passed away. So you say the castle, which is in Den Haag, it's uh, 9,450,000 rands, right? And then the second thing is, we note here that this property, this foreign property, he got it before he became ordinarily resident in South Africa. So in that way, he qualifies for a deduction. Right. But you don't have to provide the reasons, but if you had to provide the reason you say, Obtained or maybe let's say foreign property obtained before he was on a real resident in Mzansi. Wait, what did I do there? Before he was on a real resident, maybe let me put the on a real resident in South Africa. Right, that's why it is deductible. Another reason could be if he was always ordinar ordinarily resident in South Africa. Another reason this property could be exempt would be because he got it from a non-resident. So at the time of uh, the pe uh, the person he inherited from, it had the date of her death was a non-resident. So now this then would um, qualify it to be deductible from his estate, a gross estate. We've discussed that you no know, foreign estate duty was payable, so yeah, I won't talk too much on that. And then you had, you've done the first leg essentially of the transaction, and this is why I say when you read notes like this, it makes sense for you as that as soon as because you, as you're reading it, you think about it obviously, then it makes sense as soon as you include it in property, you also quickly come and deduct it so that you don't forget to deduct it later on, right? Because there's also that thing called exam pressure. But now let's come to the second leg of the transaction, which is the 110,000 rands owing to the authorities in Den Haag. Right. So what we are told today is that the portion of the foreign debt that is deductible is the the portion and the the foreign the amount of that is deductible in terms of foreign debts is the portion of the foreign debt that is in excess of foreign property not included. In, um, in the estate. So let's make that make sense. So we have the foreign debt here. And our foreign debt is 110,000 rands, right? Now from this 110,000 rands, you must deduct the value of foreign property which is not included in the estate. And this is looking right at us. It's the 9,450,000 rands, right? That's the value of the foreign property that is not included in the estate. And then you get what? Just messy. And then you get minus 9,340,000 rands. What this means is since it's a negative amount, there is no excess portion of the foreign debt that you can claim as a deduction. So here you would write zero. And your answer would be foreign debt your reason is less than value of foreign property not in state however a flip side would be let's say if we had if the foreign debt was 9 million 450,000 rands. So our taxpayer owed 9,450,000 rands to foreign tax authorities, right? Or foreign parties, foreign institutions. And the value of the property not included in his estate is 110,000 rands. So let's say, pretend now this was 110,000 rands and this was also 110,000 rands. Then in that case, here you'd come and deduct 9,340,000. 
thousand rands because that will be the portion of the foreign debt that is um, that exceeds the value of the proper foreign property not included in the estate. Quite, I think, quite quite similar, straightforward that one. But yeah. Uh, so then you will be done here yeah, with this thing. And then we are told a collection of paintings, excluding the painting in terms of uh, item two above. So excluding the Lizamona to the value of six six hundred twenty five thousand rands. So I don't know the collection of paintings which are valued at six hundred twenty five thousand rands, and they are lent. They are lent to the South African government in terms of a notarial deed uh, for a fixed period which would have ended on 31 December 2041 and the contract was um, commenced on 1 January 1996 and um, the first mark uh, like, I, like I always say first thing you should do is you collect the easy marks first what are the easy marks here there's a collection of paintings which Elvis owns and these things are valued at 625,000 rands that's the easy mark so you just quickly come here and say collection of paintings right it's 625,000 rands that's the easy mark you get a mark just for doing that right oh and then remember here they told us to show our calculations show how you would show your calculations you would say um, one one ten thousand less nine four. Just remember nine four fifty thousand equal to minus nine I think three forty. Right, and then you get half a mark for that on ten thousand rands, half a mark for the nine four fifty, and then half a mark for the raising. Right. <sighs> okay. So now let's come to the second one. So. They tell us that if um, <coughs> works of art are lent to the, to the, I think let me just copy the name myself. Is it just paintings or just works of art? Yeah, it's it's for works of art, books, pictures, statuary, and other works of art. In this case, a, a paint, paintings are works of art. If the uh, works of art are lent to the South African government, can be the national, can be the provincial, can be I think uh, a local sphere of government, right? in terms of a notarial deed so they must be lent to the government in terms of a um, notarial deed for a period that is at least 30 years and it's an end test so you must meet all four requirements and the deceased passed away within that period in this case elvis passed away in 2023 and 2023 is comes before 2041 so he passed away within the period and from 2041 to 1996, I think that is 45 years. I'm not a genius. I've been doing the test. This is the last word. So I uh, pretty pretty much have these things in my head right now. So it's 45 years, right? So we meet all four. The paintings are works of art, and those works of art are lent to the South African government. So requirement one met. Um, in terms of a notarial deed, requirement two met. And for a period that is at least 30 years, requirement 3 is met, is met because 45 years is more than uh, 30 years, the, re the required 30 years, so that is at least 30 years. Right, and requirement 4 is that the deceased who owns these paintings must have passed away within um, the period of the, the lending. And in this case, 2041, the, the lease will end in 2041, and he passed away in 2023. So we need to have 4. What that means is quite simply. You must deduct these babies. Deduct them. Um, yeah, that's about it there. We are done. And then we have an insurance policy to the value of 3 million rands. Uh, taken out of the Zamona painting to ensure the masterpiece against any type of damage. Elvis wanted to ensure that it would be an inheritance to be proud of. This policy had no surrender value, so the policy had no surrender value at the date of Elvis's death. As such, no payment was received. So they should exactly tell you what needs to, what you need to know. So if it was damaged, the policy would have paid out three million rands, right? However, before he passed, well, when he passed away, the painting was still proper; it was not damaged in any form. So the event that would trigger a payout has not yet occurred. So as such, the insurance. Uh, the, the, the insurance uh, had 
the policy had not started enough value when he passed away. You know, otherwise, guys, well, not even otherwise, it simply means that this is a insurance. I tell you that it has no surrender value, so we just write that no surrender value, right? And then that's it. You are done there. I feel like that's pretty much self explanatory, okay? Um, so I tell myself, I told that eight years ago, Elvis inherited household items from his last late aunt, so he inherited household items. From his late land aunt's estate, Brittany, who was a South African resident, right? The value of the household items was eight hundred and fifteen thousand. So the value of the household items was eight hundred and fifteen thousand rands then. So on the late aunt's estate, and one million nine hundred and fifty thousand rands on the date that Elvis died. So again, if you are thinking in terms of scoring the easy max first. You know that okay in property whatever happens or whatever thing i find difficult in this question but at least i should know that the household items which were valued at one million one hundred and fifty thousand rands when you died quickly collect that easy mark go and include this in property okay no estate duty was paid by elvis when he received the inheritance from britney's estate so just quickly or maybe let me just read the whole thing and then we'll discuss it these household items are left to patricia so in terms of elvis's view Okay, let's quickly discuss what's happening. The first thing that's happening here is that Elvis owns household items which are valued at 1,950,000 rands on the date of his death. So you quickly come right here. Quickly come here. And you include them in property, right? That's the easy mark. And then you come and deal with the, the difficult part. The difficult part is this. If someone inherited property and they done, die within uh, a 10 year period of inheriting property from a certain person, so when the late aunt passed away, she paid estate duty on these household items. And then Elvis inherited the household items. And then Elvis passed away within a 10 year period of the late aunt's passing. What that means is we made the first requirement of the rapid succession rebate. Why? Because Elvis passed away within 10 years. Elvis passed away eight, um, the aunt passed away eight years ago, so that's within the 10 year thing. Second one is Elvis must have paid estate duty in terms of the inheritance of these things. But in this case, we tell you that no estate duty was paid by Elvis when he received the inheritance from British estate. So what that means is it does not trigger the rapid succession thing. But if it did, pretend let's pretend it did trigger the um, the rapid succession rebate when would we trigger it um, elvis inherited property uh, from the late aunt and within a 10-year period elvis passes away in this case which is eight years right so that's one and elvis paid estate duty in terms of his inheritance from the late aunt's estate so that's two then you'd need these things and then they would trigger rapid succession Repeat. So what you would do is the first step, step one, what you need to do is compute Elvis's, compute Elvis's um, estate duty. Right, that's what you need to do. And this, that's what we are doing here. So just do this, right? Take it easy on yourself. Just do this. And complete the calculation so meaning you only think about the rapid you can just note it and you only think about the rapid succession, succession rebate once you've determined the estate duty liability okay and then step number two you compute the net value of the inheritance In Elvis's estate, sometimes some property is not the case here. Sometimes this property may have liabilities associated with it. So you take the one million nine hundred fifty thousand rands, 
and deduct from the one million nine hundred fifty thousand. Well, yeah, one million nine hundred fifty thousand rands. Any liabilities associated to that, and then you get the net value of the inheritance itself. Now, this is all the terms in Elvis's estate, right? And then step three. You determine. I don't want to say compute. Maybe determine because maybe it will probably be given to you. Determine the, but still, it's essentially the net value as well here. Net value of inheritance in. Now the second person, the the first deceased. Elvis is the second deceased. The first deceased in this case is the aunt. I'll just apply it to this scenario, but obviously you must make it generic so that you know how to master it. Estate, right? So in terms of our thing, this would be the one million nine hundred and fifty. Okay, I don't know what happened there. Maybe I press E instead of R. Well so maybe it's a fact I did. Okay. And then here, that would essentially be the 815, right? This is taking longer than I had expected. Apologies to that for the six minutes. Not bad, but we're almost done. Right, and then step four. Take, I'll essentially use, use lesser of, between uh, step three and four. Okay. Oh, I hate when this happens. Step three and four. So the lesser would be what? Would be the eight one five. The lesser would be the eight one five. And then step five. You determine one hundred percent of the estate duty attributable to this inheritance or property in Elvis's estate. So how would this look like is you'd take your estate util liability or is it you take your estate util liability here right the one we determine here you will take that liability so it's a hundred thousand and you would multiply it by the eight one five thousand and then you would divide by the net estate value so the net estate value let's say it's what it's um hundred thousand runs um twenty percent let's say is what um, so it's five hundred thousand runs plus three point five so four million what you might say four million right so it means eight one five or what four million runs hundred thousand runs so the hundred thousand runs this is the estate duty liability that Elvis must pay in total, right? But then in that hundred thousand estate duty liability, you want to know what is attributable to that inheritance he got from the aunt within a ten year who whom he passed away within a ten year period. And you want to compare that to the total net value of his estate. Right. And they also give you hundred percent, right? And then step six, now the last step. Step six, you determine the percentage. In this case, we tell you that this guy, uh, he passed away eight years ago. So you know, okay, that means it's not more than eight years. If it's not more than eight years, in terms of your, if you look at that table on your slides on self, it says um, it's not more than eight years, then it's 40%. And then you take, um, Answer from step five multiply by percentage as a table. Okay. 
Okay, last step, step seven. You just deduct, deduct step six amount, but I think there's a limit to it. But limited to what? I forgot, let me just quickly look at this example. It's limited to, um, John died five years after with the maximum value of 40,000. Oh. Yeah, but limited to the estate duty on the first first deceased um, uh, on the first deceased estate. So yeah, limited to E D as attributable to this property on ants, which is the first deceased first deceased estate. Just do the example. I'm using last year's text because I left the other text to get the office. But you will see when you read the, the even on the current the, the updated textbook, once you read the uh, succession rebate thing, there's a quick example. That's basically how this thing. And then yeah, you can just maybe I don't know follow these steps. But you'll see it's not that difficult. But yeah, um, it does require some a bit of practice, like every other thing. Then you master it quickly. Okay. Um, but now, yeah, we come here to the last part. We are told that these household items are left to Patricia in terms of Elvis's will, and like I said, everything left to the surviving spouse qualifies as a, as a deduction. So we do do that. Take these babies. Come place them here. We deduct them. Why? Because um, it's a bequest. To survive expose. Right. Okay. Um, let me quickly come here now. Um, Elvis is a state contained the following liabilities and costs. So we have uh, these liabilities and costs. Yeah, guys, you I beg you, I beg you. These are liabilities and costs. So <laughs> we have no business including these things as property. But I understand maybe it's sometimes due to exam stress, you, you know. Even the straightforward things, you, you just mix them up. But guys, yeah, please, please be mindful and active. That's why I also recommend them. Please make sure you get enough rest before before the exam because it, it matters. Just because when I go there with a rested mind, that you can think and process information properly. Okay, so these are liabilities and costs. So that means you have no business. You are just dealing with the actions now. You just come here and you collect easy marks. Okay. So we have size, a final income tax assessment that must be paid. So that's 500,000 rands. Funeral cost of 8,000 rands. A loan, and we're told this is a market bonus of the house in table view, which was a note one. It's owing to HM Bank, and then it's 1.5 million rands. So the funeral cost of 8,000 rands, maybe just for formality's sake. Uh, cost of administration of the estate, including master's fees and executor's remuneration, that's 55,200 rands. Right, we'll deal with this later, but let's just quickly deal with our liabilities there. So, we have a sales liability, that's minus 500,000 rands. And then we have a funeral cost, that's minus 8,000 rands. And then we have um, a loan. In the table view house, and remember, our we tax the net estate, so the loan is deductible. For normal tax, you'll say the loan is capital in nature, but in this case, it is property. So, it well, it's not property, it is deductible because it is a liability on property that we've included in the estate. Uh, the last one is what the admin costs. I think that's 55,200 pounds, but I might have to quickly check here. And then, remember, you, yeah, yeah, I beg you again, guys. Deductions, you must show them in brackets or at least a minus sign next to it to show that you are deducting. Some of you guys have a habit of showing deductions in those positive amounts, which I don't get, honestly. Okay, and then um, it says that except for the bequest mentioned above, all remaining assets and cash in Elvis's estate are left to the JJG Art Institute in Cape Town. And But we are told here it is not a registered public benefit organization. If it was, then these things would qualify 
as um, whatever is goes to is bequeathed to JJG Art Institute, then they would qualify as um, a deduction here. What that means is this. That simply means that um, Elvis will get taxed on anything, uh, on everything he left to his children. Because essentially he had, um, he had three beneficiaries. One was his wife, two were his children, and three is the JJJ, JJG Art Institute. So if it was a registered public benefit organization, it, there would be these things would be deductible, right? And then you'd have to look at, okay, what was not left to the wife or children? But yeah, what was not to, what was not left to the the wife and children, right? And that would be the stuff that you essentially get text on and whatever is that is, then determine what's the value of the um property that goes to the JJG Art Institute, and then that would be your deduction. Okay, in this case, but now we're done. Let's just compute the value of our gross estate. So that's the value of our gross estate, but then now we deduct the form, but then let's make that in bold and make it look cute with some, I don't know, let's box it. And then uh, let's compute our net estate, which essentially is that. Then again, make it in bold, box it, and then now we deduct our 3.5. In this case, you only have to think whether or not he gets um, more than the 3.5 million rands because in terms of who he's married to, he's the first person to die. And then, in this case, you must ask yourself, if Patricia passes away, will she get any portion of this 3.5 million rands? The answer is no. Why? Because Elvis has fully utilized the 3.5 million rands. However, if Elvis's estate was 2 million rands, then his abatement would also be two million rands and then when uh elvis when um uh, patricia passes away she would then get the portion which elvis didn't use the portion of the 2.5 million abatement that elvis did not use in that case that would be 1.5 million rands 2.5 less the 2 million rands right so in other words patricia would get an abatement of 4.5 million rands if it's a polygamist marriage then you'd have to divide it by the number of surviving spouses and then the, the, the person who the surviving spouse who passed away first you would have deducted that uh, that portion of the abatement so maybe if there were four it would be twenty five percent of the one point five million rands so on and so forth if there were three it would be a third if there were two it would be half of that right okay and then our oh, detail amount okay not that deep Our equity per amount is 3,686,800 rands. That's our equity per amount. And then, obviously, it's less than 30 million rands. Then we levy tax on it at 20%. And that's our estate duty. And that also concludes the tutorial for today. And again, I apologize for not being able to essentially do it in class. I have like a personal matter which I must attend to and guys yeah this is the last tutorial of the year all the best and I know you can do it please don't give up on yourself especially not now you've worked so hard this year just carry on doing what you're doing studying and investing maximum effort and trust me you will pay off goodbye